This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Um, so, uh, seeing the presence of a quorum of the Regional School Committee, I'm calling to order this meeting at 6.02 p.m. Um, and we'll take uh, roll call attendance. Please state present when I call your name. Mr. Demling? Demling present. Mr. Harrington? Harrington present. Ms. Kenny? Kenny present. Ms. Lord? Lord present. Ms. Seeger? Seeger present. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer present. Ms. Stancer? Stancer present. And McDonald present. So we are in, in session. And I will turn it over to uh, Ms. Cunningham for facilitation. Well, thank you. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to thank both the school committee and the APEA exec board uh, for taking the time to start this conversation. This is a very public opportunity, and hopefully this is the first of many discussions that we'll be able to have. Um, one of the things I want to state for this evening is that I'm facilitating the beginnings of a conversation, right? Um, what I'm doing is not considered a restorative circle. So this is by no means doing justice to any of the restorative circles that you have seen done. Um, it was a very quick opportunity for me to be asked to facilitate this meeting. And I thank you all for having that trust in having me facilitate. So thank you there. But I also want people to know that this is not a circle by no means as how circles are usually conducted. Um, so the agenda item was listed as a discussion about, let me say it directly, meeting the educational needs of our students during the pandemic and how we can safely get students and staff into the building. So that's my understanding of what this whole conversation is going to be about. And as this discussion unfolds, there are um, there may not be any closure, there may not be any solutions that will take place tomorrow uh, or answers to some of the pressing questions that we're hoping would be answered. So once again, it's just the start of a conversation. And finally, for the school committee and the exec board, I just want you to know that although I have upgraded my grid system here, that I can't really see everyone. So please don't take it personally if your hand is raised and I don't call on you. I have asked Dr. Morris to assist me in seeing who may have their hands up that I haven't um, recognized so that he can let me know whose hands are raised. Okay. So with that being said, as with most meetings, there are norms. So I wanna get through the norms before we get started. Um, these norms are simply saying that we're going to respect each other, right? We're going to respect the conversation. We're going to respect the purpose of us getting together. And your staying on this call means that you are willing to abide by the norm, okay? So the first norm is one person at a time will speak like we normally hear, and that you're going to use I statements if you're talking about how you are feeling. If you are talking on behalf of your organization, then you will use the we statement. Another is that we're going to assume positive intentions. We're going to focus on solutions. We're going to listen in order to understand, not listen to respond, but listen to understand each other's point of view. We're also going to accept and expect non-closure. So those are the six norms that I have written out here. And like I mentioned, you're staying on this call means that you are willing and ready to abide by those norms. So to begin, I only wrote down three prompts, so three pressing questions that we will have, and each side will have an opportunity to speak. So each member of each group will have an opportunity to speak, and then the other group will have an opportunity to speak to the same thing. So that's how we're going to work it. Um, the first prompt, this basically begins, because I know that this has been very public, there's been a lot of information in the news, and people in the community and our staff and our families need to know 
the responsibilities that both sides have when it comes to making decisions, right? You all have this heavy responsibility when you're making your decisions. And I want each side to be able to talk about the points, the parameters, and the responsibilities you each have when you are making the decisions that you are making. So with that, um, we'll start with the APEA exec board. And as I mentioned, we'll go through that board for anyone who'd like to speak. And then once they are finished, then we will have the school committee respond. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Doreen. I'll go ahead and uh, I'll start first. And um, I prepared a statement, but it basically answers that prompt. Um, so my name is uh, Lamiko McGee, and I am the acting president for the APA at this time. We are committed to democratic process in the APA. We follow the lead of our representative council and membership. Uh, our next representative council meeting, which we inform the school committee is Monday. And at that time, we'll review the data of a member survey and bring the issue um, and possible options to our representative council for discussion. Um, we followed a democratic process in gathering input from membership during the negotiation of the MOA, in which over 100 members volunteered their time over the summer to work on various committees. We also facilitated conversations with families. Over the past few months, many statements in the media have been made about educators um, questioning our dedication to students and the community. We are the community too. We are parents too. And we're committed to students in our profession. Educators have worked tirelessly to serve our students remotely and in their homes during this pandemic while managing our own households and challenges we know that the school committee, superintendent, assistant superintendent face some of these same challenges in their dedication to students and community. We believe it's critical for us to work together, communicate respectfully and efficiently with each other for the benefit of our students and our families and our community. So I thank you for allowing this opportunity for us to be able to initiate um, this communication and um, hopefully what this leads to is for us to have a common understanding of what we need to do to serve our community, our students, and our families. Thank you. This is an open opportunity right now for anyone from the APEA Executive Board to be able to speak. Hi, sure. Um, so I'm Tiffany Thibodeau. I am the Unit A uh, co-chair for the secondary educators. And I, I guess I just want to add along with what um, Mika has shared as our president is that um, our role as the um, Amherst Pelham Education Association is to advocate for the working conditions of our educators in the units A, B, and C. Um, so that includes our teachers, nursing staff, counseling staff, paraprofessionals, and um, clerical staff. This is still an open opportunity for APEA and select board members to speak. Um, it might be helpful. Could you rephrase or restate, not rephrase, the question or the prompt? Mm -hmm. Well, basically, I was saying that there are responsibilities that you share or parameters that you look at when you are making the decisions that you make. Um, what I believe I've heard uh, Tiffany Thibodeau mention is that your job is to advocate on behalf of the working condition of teachers. But I believe. Um, Ms. McGee to have stated was that you go to your rep council and your membership and you survey them and you bring back information based on what they have mentioned. And so the question is just con to continue to state how you make your decisions when you are making the decisions. Because I know many of the community want to know how you base your decision or what you base your, what's your decision making process. 
Um, I will add a little bit. Um, I'm not good at speaking on the, uh, you know, ad lib and I had a prepared statement which really doesn't fit here, but I'm going to try um, and just say that everything, you know, of course what Mika and Tiffany said um, is what we're about. We, um, at the same time, regularly acknowledge that as educators, our purpose is educating children and our working conditions are their learning conditions, as teachers often say, and that's uh, something that we factor in when we're considering our responsibilities and so on. Thank you. Once again, I know that there are a few more board members. You have an opportunity if you'd like to speak. Um, <clears throat> hello, everybody. My name is Margaret Todd or Miss Maggie. And um, I am a kindergarten para at Wildwood. And um, I prepared a small statement. Um, and I just wanted to read it here because um, I had to write it down because otherwise I get all. Um, so I just wanted to address something that happened a little while ago and um, it's been kind of weighing heavy on my heart. And um, I just wanted to say that as educators, we eat, sleep and breathe better for our community and our students. And as APA members, we eat, sleep and breathe better for our community, students and our coworkers. And um, last month, there was a letter sent to the staff across the district. And along with those letters, many of the staff, including myself, received um, other emails from families telling staff that they must attend union meetings and vote in their favor. And these families are families that I hold very dear to my heart. Some of the families are families I know personally. Um, I just feel like this is a huge violation of boundaries and it puts a strain on the relationships that educators strive so hard to make with their families and their students. Um, the school committee and admin really missed the opportunity to stand up for educators that teach the children in this community. And it is as, it is as if we are not viewed as members of the same community, but as other. And in the spirit of restoration, I would like to propose that during future negotiations between APA, school committee, that we should put out a formal statement to the district and its families expressing the norms of the process. Um, just as we have to follow norms during discussions on, on video or through email, families should be held to the same standards. And just one last thing, I would like to say that our families are the third leg of our tripod. And just as staff have an outlet for families, I mean, just as staff, staff have an outlet like the APA, families should as well so that the community, so the communication can be respectful and within the boundaries. Okay. So thank you for sharing that. What I do want to just remind us is that we are the APEA exec board and the school committee that are um, having this conversation. And so I want to keep it to the things that the APEA and the school committee have done and are working on to combine and com come together. Um, I understand the letter had a big impact, but right now we don't have families on this call to have the families speak as to how their process or their thinking um, as to why they wrote the letter or the rationale for the letter. So I wanna just make sure that we're keeping it with APEA and school committee. So once again, we do have a few um, APEA exec board members here who I'd like them to, if you so choose, to have an opportunity to speak. This okay. is in regards to the first question. So I think, uh, I'm not sure if there's anyone else on the board that has um, a response to that first question. All right, so we will transition now to the school committee. 
and we'll ask the same question. It may sound a little different, but it's the same. Um, just your decision-making process, what goes into the parameters when you are making the decisions that you make? Um, I, I can speak first, and um, or I'm uh, Allison McDonald, um, and I'm, I'm actually speaking on my own, not on the behalf of the committee. Everybody else from the committee is here and can speak their, their own perspective. Um, I, um, for, for those, um, we, we skipped over introductions, so I'll just, by way of, of introduction, I'm um, an Amherst resident of 18, 18-ish years and have two kids um, in the district that have come through Fort River and now in the middle school and the high school. Um, I think, uh, not sure that sort of the best way or most succinct way, and unlike um, others that have well-prepared statements and comments, I don't, um, so I'm a little bit off the cuff, so forgive me. Um, but I, I see our role as school committee as, as really representing um, not just the voice of the community, but also keeping um, all of the needs of all of the stakeholders in the school district in mind as we work through and um, and and make our decisions. And our decisions are limited in scope. Um, we 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 don't have. Um, I know that uh, the community sometimes thinks that we have a lot more authority and scope um, of of power, if you will, than than we in fact do. So. Um, uh, but I think, you know, when we are making those decisions on um, that are in the purview with the school committee, um, at least as I go about it, I'm trying my best to keep the, the needs, the desires, um, and the educational mission of all of our stakeholders in mind. Um, and, but first and foremost, really our students um, that we are, are serving, because that is core to our mission of our school district. Um, the families um, and their lives and the challenges that they face, particularly in a pandemic like now, are, are, are critical in, in making those decisions, as are the needs um, and challenges that um, our educators and staff um, that work in the district, because um, all of those, those pieces work together to fulfill that mission, which is with our students at the heart of that mission. Um, so at least when I'm going through um, and looking at sort of the choices, the difficult choices and difficult planning that we've had to do over the last year and will have to continue to do in the coming year. I first, I think first about what our students need and then our families and our community and our, and I mean the full community of stakeholders in order to serve those students. Um, and I will, as we all know that are on this call, it is exceptionally challenging and difficult um, when it feels in a situation like now in a pandemic that a choice that might be beneficial or helpful for me or student A or family B um, may feel like it's taking something away from somebody else. And that is just a really, really difficult position for any of us to have to be in, to feel like to serve one, we, we are taking something away or constraining somebody else. Um, so I, I, that doesn't answer that question about making decisions, but I think might put some context in there um, that we as volunteers in the community have been put and forced into this situation of having to make very, very difficult decisions and trade-offs um, within the scope. So, um, sorry, I've babbled on for too long. So, <laughs> thank you. That's fine, thank you. And the floor is open to school committee members. So if you are a school committee member at this time and would like to speak, please do so and introduce yourself. Um. Tareen, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm only speaking because I think someone just joined by phone and I want to make sure that person has the opportunity to identify themselves um, and participate if um, if they choose to. So um, if, if if it's okay, Doreen, I know you might not have been able to see that. That's why only reason I jumped in. But it looks like it may be Hala who's using her phone as well as the screen. So um, I think she's already identified herself or can do so. Um, I'm sorry, that's the only reason I jumped in and I'm going to jump right back out. Thank you. Ms. Lord, were you going to speak? You're muted, Heather. Okay, I had I'd called in. 
because it wasn't working. My computer keeps freezing, but I'm just going to try to talk. And if I freeze, I apologize. I hung up. Um, in terms of when I make a decision, um, the point of the parameters, up until even in September, I was in the halls as an educator. So I come from years of education. I, my scaffolding is I, I think about the students first and foremost, and then I wrap around their families, and then the educators, if I'm doing a ladder, and then the administration and school committee and DESE and, and up and up. Um, so I think, like I prioritize the students. So if it's a concentric circle, sorry, I didn't have the, you know, I do the circles and my primary, because all of us, we are all important to this life of the student and our families and the community. But I start with that. I try to get here as many voices. Um, a lot of voices don't participate in surveys. And so how can we be in the community to be visible? It's been tricky during a pandemic. So I can't just sit in you know, a complex and say, hey, come meet me these two hours. I'll be here. Let's ch chat. Um, we did do that a little in the summer with masks and distance, but um, so it's been tricky and challenging, but I try to hear as many voices as I can. I also do factor in like different articles, science, um, as much as I like, I, oh wait, maybe I'm getting off the, I just try to get as much information as I can, have it all spread out. Sometimes I put it on post-it notes on the wall because my mind has a lot going on and really sit with it. And I don't do it in my best interest. I do it in what the voices of what I hear is needed most with the science and the, the other considerations. Sorry, that was really clumsy, but that's part of how I make my decisions in a, I mean, oh no, yeah, in a big way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The opportunity is still open for school committee members. Yeah, I'll go ahead. So I'm Ben Harrington. Um, some of you folks have been my co-workers in the past, but so I'm the, currently the assistant facility director for Amherst Public Schools. I've also served as a custodian at Wildwood and Fort River, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll just jump right into my, my decision-making process. Those of you that know me know that I'm, I'm a communicator, AKA a talker. So I, I try to suss things out as best as I can. It, and, and, you know, when it comes to issues, I try to bounce things off of as many different people as humanly possible. I also take in a lot of the, the emails we, we get here. I, I think some of you folks probably get similar emails and, and it, I try to do my best to kind of take the, uh, the personal out of it and, and just balance it. And realistically, I don't know if this sounds crazy, but the the key part of my decision making process is to try to look forward as far as possible to see how the decisions i make right now are going to affect other people in the long term right I, i'll be all right i'm you know somewhat of a survivor i guess but I'm, I'm mostly concerned with how like the impact of what it is that we do here and and i mean this is the most important work we can be doing right all of us everyone who's here so just keeping it short and sweet here Thank you. Go ahead. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for, for being here tonight. It's really nice to get faces to go with everybody's names. Um, my name is Carrie Spitzer, and I'm, uh, you know, I grew up in Amherst, um, graduated from Amherst High School a long time ago. Um, but I, I currently have um, three kids. One of them's in the district right now and two will be shortly. So I, I'm also a researcher. I, I really love, um, you know, <laughs> studying problems and coming up with optimal solutions. You know, that's what I was, you know, I've studied public policy and, and the thing that's been really, really hard this year is that there are no optimal solutions. And I think, um, you know, I've often what I've leaned on, you know, is, you know, finding, you know, the expert opinion or the the journal, you know, just to come to an optimal decision. And I think that's been really hard this year. And so I just want to recognize that I, I think all of us have been struggling to to make choices um, that we've never in a million years thought we'd be you faced with this year. And it's been really hard. So when I am, you know, when I because I can't just lean on um, on that research 
you know, piece, I've, I've tried to, you know, I've read every single email that's come in, listen to all the public comment um, when we get it. And, and I do say, you know, I think I, I, there are limits and, you know, I'm super busy with work and three kids. So I, I you know, haven't been responding to all the emails at any, you know, as much as I would have liked. I haven't been able to get out and talk to folks because we're in a pandemic. So, you know, this feels um, like I wish we were face to face, but, and, and that's been a lot of what's been happening this year. I think that's made it harder. So I think one of the things that I really like to do is talk face to face with people and it's made it really hard. So um, this is not optimal, but I'm really glad it started and um, just want to thank everybody and that's it. Okay. I'm Peter. Hi, I'm Peter Dumling, uh, resident of Amherst. Um, had three kids through the Amherst Regional Public Schools, one currently on um, almost every building. Um, so in terms of the, the responsibility part of the question, um, with almost every topic I approach on school committee, I, I, I start from this, my, my own personal synthesis of what our mission is, which is equal access to the highest quality education for all students. And, and there's a lot packed in there, um, but, but the things that really drive me a lot and, and that are driving me on this particular, how do we get kids back in the building issue is, is equal access and, and all students. Um, so, you know, by all students, it's not just, you know, 95% of students, it's every, every student, every type of student, um, especially those who um, are, are the most vulnerable and who might not have the, the strongest advocates. Um, so as, as my role on as the representative to CPAC, our special ed parent advisory council, um, I hear a lot of those stories directly. Um, and that, that's pretty intense. Um, uh to 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 um to absorb um and to to then try and integrate into how that should affect our decisions um you know which gets to the the parameters part of the question um you know there's we we talked really early on uh when we first started planning about this this tension point and i think Ms. mcdonald's to harrington just touched on this a little bit about um you know that there's, there's never going to be a perfect solution and um you know we have a non-zero health risk on on the one hand during an active pandemic, and we also have a non-zero educational cost and personal cost, and you know to students and families. And um, and you know we did the best we could, and I, I think I think all parties, um, you know, acted in good faith, and we got the best we could at the time. And now we know a lot more, right about both the health risk and the educational cost. And uh, in terms of the parameters of the things that are driving how I think about this um, is, is the, the opinions of medical professionals about how, um, uh, about how we manage safety and how we, how we create safe environments um, and, and, and the educational cost. Um, and and we've, we've heard the, the school committee heard Quite a bit of, uh, about the educational cost from parents directly in public uh, input, and you know, anecdotal story after anecdotal story about the impact to their children. And um, you know, uh, without putting a quantifiable percent or number on it, a lot of students are struggling, and a lot of families are struggling. And uh, our survey data showed it disproportionately affected. Um, uh, students of color. It, it survey data. Uh, we know that. Um, Low-income families are being disproportionately affected. We, we know that students with an IEPs, and so um, it it only makes the problem more challenging. And that so that that is what's driving the urgency. You know, I think um, uh, and, and and to do it in a safe way, because at the end of the day, I, you know, we 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 can't have amazing schools without amazing teachers. And I believe personally that the reason why Emerson Regional Public Schools are the best schools in the region is because we have amazing teachers and because we support our teachers. Who, who support our students. And so, um, you know, we have, to, we have to drive towards finding that balance in, in an urgent manner. That's, 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 that, that's how I, I, I land on it in, in, imperfectly and without closure as <laughs> Ms. Cunningham um, identified at the beginning. Thank you. Well, the floor is still open for school committee members. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, I'm Margaret Stancer. I'm a elected to the Pelham School Committee, and as part of that, I am also a member of the Regional School Committee. Um, when I think about making decisions uh, from the school committee, I feel some responsibility to the community that elected me, so I will listen to the input from the community. Um, we have direct contact, direct contact with, in the case of Pelham, with the superintendent and the principal, occasionally maybe from a, a teacher, but not usually. Um, I'm retired, so I've had children go through the system, but I don't have direct contact right now because I don't have children or in the system. And I, I this has been a really difficult time. Um, as everybody has said, there, when you take in all of the input, um, there's no good solution for everybody. So it's been really challenging. And um, I try my best to hear all of the pieces. Um, so I would also just like to say I appreciate the opportunity to actually see teachers and have this conversation with teachers because that for me hasn't really happened. Um, thank you. I see about two other members of the school committee. Like I said, my screen doesn't show everyone, but if anyone else from the school committee would like to speak, the floor is open. Yeah. I'll say something. Hi, I'm Bethany Seeger. I am um, representative from Leverett and I've been on the Leverett School Committee uh, for a little while now. This is my second term. Um, and in that committee, so most, so I joined the regional committee in June, I believe. So I'm relatively new to it and I'm still really learning sort of the full picture and how everything and all the groups fit together. Um, so I'll speak more to how I've thought about decisions over the last five years from a Leverett point of view, um, there, I, I think about the children in the school, um, I think about the learning environment and the school community um, and, and trying to do what's best for them, um, for the group at large. Um, you know, I'll be honest too, we think a lot about budget there with the, all the towns around here reaching their um, tax levy ceiling. So there's, there's always that um, in the budget in Leverett has been challenging in the last four or five years. Um, so there's a lot of that too, but that that to me comes after thinking about the first two categories of children in the school community um, and what's best for um, people involved and the families involved. Um, and this year, it just feels like no decisions we make are easy. There's just no good options. Um, you know, I, I generally try to find the option that feels the best. And it's just been a year of not being able to have a best or in many ways a good option and, and both both um, in my school committee life as well as my personal life um, and you know just all the choices we as people have had to make that are just subpar um, and I'm appreciative that we're here tonight all talking together and I'm just really appreciative of hearing what um, everybody has to say so thank you. Thank you and I believe Sarah Best you had raised your hand. Hi, I'm Sarah Bass Kenny. I'm from the Pelham part of the region. Um, I um, also went through the regional schools and graduated a long time ago um, and now have a kid in Pelham and one in the middle school. And so first, I just wanted to recognize like the amazing work I have witnessed this year from all of the teachers we have had any contact with. The communication has been fantastic. While my kids have had a very hard time schooling from our painted room, it has nothing to do with the lack of effort and heart that all of the teachers have put in. So first, thank you so much for all of your hard work. It's, it's just clear. Um, and when it comes to my personal decision making about school committee things, um, I try to think of, um, First and foremost, our students, and especially the ones that 
don't necessarily have a voice um, as loud as some other others may. Um, and one of my favorite things about being from Pelham and its tiny little town is that I know a lot of the teachers. And we, since my kids have like literally gone through the whole thing, I know all the teachers there. And I love that we have a relationship where we can have conversations. So I am really, I don't know if excited is the right word, but happy we're all here having conversations together now. Um, I feel like this is a great step forward. And so thank you for starting that. So I think about our, our students and our towns and how we can, um, like Peter said, I think we have the best schools around. It's why it's why my mom moved us here a long time ago, and it's why I decided to stay here with my own children. Um, and to um, to keep that tradition of great schools going forward with great teachers and great programs. So, thank you, Dr. Morris. There are others who are on the grid that I cannot see. I'm just wondering if anyone else has. Uh, raise their hand. No. Okay. I'll keep an so, eye out for you. <laughs> thank you. So one of the main reasons why I started with that prompt is because I wanted the community and everyone to know that when you are all making decisions, as I believe I heard from everyone here, that you're making it on behalf of whether it's communication with stakeholders or input from stakeholders, on behalf of students, on behalf of families, on behalf of educators, staff, um, when you're you're making decisions based on advocacy work, on behalf of the same stakeholders and community members, and for some, I heard twice the mission statement. So what we've committed to as an organization is how we've also looked to make decisions. And so I wanted that background to be understood before we move further. So the next. Um, that I have basically is just for um, Ms. McGee and Ms. McDonald. And with this, I'm just going to ask you both, um, at this point we'll start with Ms. McDonald, but what is one assumption that's out there in the community right now that you would like to have dispelled, like refute right now? One assumption. I would have to go first. <laughs> um, I, I think um, th there's probably, if, if I had more time, I probably could come up with, with several, frankly, but I, I think the one that sticks in my mind and, and sort of why I too am happy that we're here together this evening um, is, that, um, is that the school committee doesn't care. Um, and we don't hear that from everybody um, by any means, but I, I think you know that's one that sort of really actually hurts when 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 we do hear that. I think and um, you know probably not always um, visible to see that, but I, I I think you know by listening to um, and actually I'm learning a lot listening to all of not just all of you um, from APEA but also the the school committee too because we we don't usually talk this way. Um, but that we that we don't care about um, about the the educators that we don't care about families uh, you know every I, th I think it, it's not any one audience that would would say that and I think um, you, you know through through it all I I know that for for myself as well as my my colleagues on the school committee that 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 just isn't the case and I think what we've heard and listening to all of all of you is that. It's just a, a year of tremendously difficult decisions that there's no great answer that is that feels like we're caring for it, for everybody as well as maybe the next person. And I think that's that's the one that's the, the assumption that I would most like to sort of dispel in in people's minds. Thank you, Ms. McGee. Um, thank you. I think one of the, the bigger assumptions out there, I mean, there, there are so many out there right now, uh, but I think the one that's most uh, disheartening uh, and challenging for educators is this assumption that 
um, that we don't want to be in the school building with our children. Um, it is, uh, it's, and I'm a special education teacher. And so a lot of what I do is about proximity, uh, uh, nonverbal cues, um, and sometimes just being there. The reality of it is I keep a lot of snacks in my room, and sometimes it's really easy to get them to do work if I can just give them a snack. <laughs> and I can't do any of those things uh, remotely. Uh, and so uh, trying to find a way to engage students and to continue the learning process while we're not in buildings um, in a remote way is, is extremely difficult uh, for teachers. Um, I, they, we are certainly putting in a lot more hours in preparing our lessons and trying to figure out how to get students who just uh, don't seem to engage and they're having difficulty with remote learning to get them to um, engage. And so I think it's really disheartening for, uh, for me anyway, um, as a teacher, uh, to to have this um, this narrative out there that you know um, the reason why um, we take the position that we take is this idea that we don't want to be in the building with our students, which is just not the case. Uh, we want everyone to be healthy and safe, um, and we are doing our very best at remote learning. And I hope that as been apparent. Um, and how we have been communicating with families and the responses from students um, as best that we can. Uh, we know that, that all students are not engaging and we're fully aware that we have students that uh, remote learning is certainly not ideal for and it is ideal for us to be in the building with our students. And hopefully by opening up communications here um, hopefully we have a lot more brain power here and we're working together to maybe get to the point where um, we can find a solution because as I've heard from you all and, and certainly we've had this many, many, many discussions within our organization, um, there's no easy solution. Um, but maybe by working together and, and, and communicating more effectively and efficiently, and, um, maybe we can move toward that. Thank you. So now I will open the opportunity for anyone else who is on this um, in this meeting to be able to answer that same question about the assumptions that you would like to discuss. Any APEA or school committee member can respond. Tiffany Thibodeau, you may go. Sure. Um, I think the other thing that I'll sh will share is that um, I think the assumption is that um, the APA executive board is the 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 one or the the all knowing all decision making body. Um, but I think we want to just remind people that the APA is all Amherst Pelham education and educators, and we make decisions together. And part of what makes it a messy process, part of what makes it a time consuming process is that we work really hard to discuss together and come to a place where everyone can at least live with the decisions that were being made. Um, and because of this democratic process and because it takes time to hear from everyone's voices, sometimes um, the decision doesn't necessarily work in the, in the favor that one individual may have because it is a collective body and we are making decisions, taking a lot of things into account and a lot of people's um, experiences and own um, the way it would impact our students and the way it impacts a variety of staff into account as we make our decisions. Thank you. The floor is still open for any school committee member or any APEA board board member to speak. I see um, Mangala has her hand up. Ms. Jagadish, please. So I am really happy with what I'm hearing here today. And this feels like what I would like to see happen all the time. And the assumption that I think the community has and maybe even members here have is that school committee and APA are on different sides of something where we're all working for the students of our Amherst Public Schools. And 
I really would like the entire community and for all of us here to see that 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 we are on the same side here, and that moving forward, that's what's going to push us into being able to help our students. Thank you. Do you see any other hand? Oh, uh, Mr. Demling? Yeah, I, I, I'll go with two. Um, one, uh, one, one assumption to dispel is that the school committee doesn't value remote learning. Um, I think, and Dr. Morris has talked about this before, is that, um, you know, when to talk about the urgent need to return to students in, in buildings, it, it can come with the perception that maybe we're saying there is no value to remote learning. And, you know, personally, I feel because of the way how it was thoughtfully designed and because of the dedication and efforts of our teachers, I feel like we, we have the best in class uh, remote learning. I feel like we have the best designed, the best implemented of anything I've seen. Um, it's just that it, it's just a, the way I, I feel about it. There's there's a there's a ceiling to what remote lear learning can provide, and for some students, it's a pretty low ceiling. Um, and so it's it's difficult to say to always put that caveat in whenever we're talking about the return to in person. But um, I think that's one. I think another important uh, procedural process question to dispel in case anybody is is watching is that what this conversation is happening here tonight is is not we're not talking about changing the moa that's like that that's that's a negotiation process that can only start when both the school committee and the ap executive board agree to negotiate the moa and then there's a whole process so um you know it is it it is good to hear the positive vibe here <laughs> and you know that that you know having open honest communication can only do good um but this doesn't you know, no, nothing that we're talking about here tonight is is about resolving differences in, in the MOA. So it's 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 been a constant point of confusion, I think, uh, because it is kind of te a technical process, and and you know the public engages in, at different levels. Um, but it, it is something to note. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Yeah, actually, I realized I didn't introduce myself before. Um, but I'm Karen Baker. I'm vice president of APEA, and um, I've been teaching in, uh, I teach at Summit Academy, and I've been teaching in Amherst since 2008. Um, and I just wanted to, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm also feeling really good about this and um, the fact that we get to speak semi face to face and um, it feels like there's a lot of potential for opening up communication. I did just want to make one small point, which is that um, it is not the APA executive board that will decide if we're going to or how um, we would revisit the MOA, but rather, you know, it's a process that we go through with the membership. Um, and really the vote would come from the, the rep council or possibly from all members. Um, but we really follow the directive that we seek from um, the body, the representative council and uh, all members. Thank you. Dr. Morris, once again, do you see any hands? I don't think so. I think I saw a dog come into a screen, but I think that's the only thing that I saw uh, come into a screen in the last last 10 seconds. So I think, oh, I'm sorry. Nope, Mr. Harrington uh, now has his hand up. Okay, Mr. Harrington. Yeah, so there's, there's two strong misconceptions that I'd like to speak to. One that, that involves strictly the school committee. The other that involves the, the group where, where we come together as the APA and the, the school committee. And so the, as far as the school committee is concerned, I, I've seen this from all walks of life, I'll, I'll say. It, it's been a broad misconception, but that, that the school committee has been viewed some as, as some sort of like ruling body that, that exists in this ivory tower, as if we are not part of the Amherst community, as, as if we are not part of the school community. And that, that's something that I personally take I take umbrage with, you know, I, I forge through it all the time. I understand that, you know, first and foremost, I am a father, I'm a coach, I work in our schools, I work alongside you, I deal with some of you folks as kids at, at 
different times and all. And so, you know, that that's tough. But then the, the I, I think the uh, the more difficult one, I think Mika and Mr. Sullivan can can back me up on this is the, the misconception misconception that this group that, that where we talk about safety, the, the Joint Labor Management Safety Committee, that, that we are some sort of a decision making body that also exists, actually not even in, in an ivory tower, as I've heard it worded, that we uh, sit behind closed doors making decisions. That, you know, that's, that's not, it's not what we do and it's not helpful to the work that we do either. I, I feel like it's been a hindrance at times to have to deal with that. I mean, I don't know if either of you wanna refute any of that or if you agree, but that's kind of how I felt throughout this process. I, I agree, and I think that the the uh, in a school committee meeting um, that it was there's some clarification around what JLMSC does. Um, however, you know there are still you know some members of the community that somehow think that that um, there are powers that we have that um, the JLMSC that we just don't have. We come together to discuss safety issues. Thank you. Any other comments from either of the APEA select board or the school committee? Okay, so what I'm going to say is that based on this response to this prompt, I've heard that one of the assumptions uh, or some of the assumptions is that the school committee doesn't care and that um, teachers don't want to be in the building or that the school committee doesn't value remote learning. Now, uh, combining that with the initial thought of how we make decisions and knowing that most people that you come to hear those two points, they came to hear those points as to how do we get students and staff back in buildings, right? And so with that being said, I know that um, the next question that I would like to ask or the next prompt I'd like to put out there is, um, it says, what do you believe is needed for students and staff to safely return to buildings? So that being the main um, description as to what the agenda item or what the purpose of this meeting was for, the question is out there now. And it is once again, what do you believe is needed for students and staff to safely return to buildings? We know and understand that the MOA needs to um, be considered and reopen and i'm not looking for that as a response but i want the school committee and i want the apea to talk about what is needed what do you in each of your roles believe is needed for students and staff to return to buildings and with that i believe it would be the apea uh, mika um tiffany will be taking that Okay. Sure. So um, as Mika mentioned early on, um, when we, we first began this meeting, uh, we are meeting with our members on Monday um, for a our typical rep council meeting. And during that time, we will be um, communicating the data that has come from our survey committee. And we will, as a rep council, and perhaps as all members, be making a decision about next steps based on the findings that came out of that survey and based out of um, a number of building meetings that we've had and trying to communicate um, with various staff members and, and understand um, what our next steps need to be. Um, with that said, we kind of envisioned this meeting here to be the first of a few communications to move us forward and to that end we're hoping to establish some regular meetings so that we can communicate between our different parties and have dialogue um, and in the spirit of improving communication between us all we are particularly um particularly based because this is such a pressing matter um, we know that sometimes there's information and documentation that we all need to have so that we can begin to make decisions with our respective bodies. Um, so if there's a process that you um, that we could agree upon um, for receiving documents and information that we can all use to help us make decisions, that would be great. Okay. 
Next, Ms. McDonald. Um, so when I think of, um, so you asked us specifically not to mention the, the MOA, um, but I, I do, rather than say um, what with the existing MOA, I think just in general, um, we need, I think as a community, a school community, and I, and I, I use that word um, really intentionally, not to mean sort of the school committee or the APEA, but the full community. Um, we, we need to be able to come together and understand that there's no one solution of getting kids back into buildings that's going to be per perceived as the one that I want or everybody wants. There, there isn't, and that's the unfortunate thing um, I mean, even in a regular world, in a regular scenario, no pandemic, um, there's, it's challenging to meet everybody's needs equally. Um, and we're always, as a, as a school community, striving to do better at that. Um, but I think when we're, when we're thinking about this is, I would love for us to be looking for solutions or, you know, creative solutions that recognize that and are flexible to accommodate the different spectrum of needs in, in our school community, um, particularly among students. So students that desperately need to be in buildings and students that desperately need to be at home um, and every variation in between. Um, and same with, with educators and staff. Um, how can we find a solution that acknowledges the differences in experiences and needs of all of us in the community and does much better than what we're doing right now to meet those needs. I don't have answers. I'm hoping that that's what, that's what comes out of sort of collective discussion. But I think that that's, um, I, I think the first step is that we're all able to sort of acknowledge that and recognize that and sort of not be, not not make that become a barrier, but actually the framework and something that can empower us to come up with creative solutions. Okay. The floor is open for any APEA and school committee members to speak. What do you believe in here? Um, Mr. Yeah, did you call on me? Like, yeah. I didn't hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, um, so it's a pretty tricky question. <laughs> How do you get students and staff safely back in the buildings if, if we can't talk about changing the MOA? That's kind of the elephant in the room. So, um, I mean, I'll be honest, it's hard to see. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to see um how students and staff get back in the buildings anytime soon um with, with without addressing that uh because that's what determines the parameters right so um yeah um I, I i think maybe one suggestion would be to articulate as specifically and practically as possible what the goal of these continued meetings would be if, if if it's not related to the MOA at all, right? Because I mean, I, I do like being able to see people face to face. I do think that um, having open ended discussion like this is positive, even if we don't come to a bulleted list of agreements and conclusions. I, I honestly do believe that, um, and it, it feels good. You know, it's like I'm I'm feeling the good vibe. I, I feel it, and that that's good. Um, but I also would not want to miss um I, I wouldn't want to set out on a well-intentioned co collaborative effort that didn't practically lead to a specific place right and i wouldn't want to set expectations with the public that we are embarking on an, an in, a new initiative that doesn't have a really well-defined conclusion so that would be my one kind of con concern about this, this continued format um it's, it's uh -huh. not that i don't feel that it's good and positive. I just I just think a little clarity around 
um, you know, what does it mean practically and specifically as distinct from the other thing which is going on, which is do we or don't we talk about changing the MOA? Right, so let me clarify some information. What was shared with me was that this first meeting was basically to give everyone an opportunity to talk, possibly build trust among the two groups. And therefore, if there was no need to bring up the MOA as a point to be changed, that could be for further discussion or the next meeting. But this one is just to um, introduce you to each other and talk about how we move forward from here, building that trust amongst you. Okay. Ms. Jack, would you like to speak? You're on mute. You'd think I would know that after all these weeks and weeks of remote teaching. <laughs> oh, and I didn't introduce myself. Um, Dr. Cunningham called me Ms. Jag. I am, I teach second graders at Wildwood and I am the APA Unit A co-chair, elementary chair. So I really like what Ms. McDonald said about creative solutions and teachers have creative solutions. That's what we're all about. That's what we spend every day doing with our students. So I do feel like there are many avenues that we could explore here. Um, and I wanna start by just backing up a little bit with the, so the first part of the agenda was, um, was meeting the educational needs of ARP school children during a pandemic. And I see the first step in that, in us working together is to repair the relationship between APA and school committee. So that's what this meeting is the beginning of. And I don't think that we can get anywhere together without having that relationship be a good relationship. And um, so to that end, I wanna plead for respectful, honest communication. We, the APA, are educators. We wanna spend our energy teaching our students. And when we need to spend our energy responding to things that are being said in the press or responding to one-sided narratives, that takes away our energy from what we are really here to do, which is to educate the children of Amherst. And um, so I guess what I would really need is to know that when we embark on this next step, that that is where we're headed with respectful communication, honest communication with each other, and that the media or the community is not used in any way to try to direct or bully or um, cause APA or school committee to move in certain directions. And we understand that the school committee is that the community members are your constituents. Um, but having that play out in the press doesn't seem like it's a productive way to move forward. So I really hope that we can all leave this meeting being assured that everyone here, school committee, executive board of the APA, rep council of the APA, and all the APA members are doing this work for the collective good of our collective children. Thank you for sharing that. So I just want to revisit two of our norms, and it was to assume positive intention. So when everyone decided to stay in the call, they decided that, you know, we're going to assume that each entity here are here for positive reasons and on behalf of the kids or and the community and all stakeholders. So thank you again for, um, for reminding us that that's why we are here. And also, just that we're going to accept and expect non-closure, right? That we may think that today we should be talking about the MOA or we should touch the topic, but that's not why we're here. Once again, we're here to start to build that trust. And so that was the purpose of this meeting. Future meetings, when they occur, will hopefully start to open that conversation, right? But we have to build that foundation of trust that's not here yet before we can move forward as a group. Okay. Uh, Kristen? Hi, um, I'm Kristen Rhodes, and I am the APA secretary, and I'm a special education teacher at Fort River in one of the district programs building blocks. And um, 
I just wanted to say that one of the things I hope that we can do together is like Alice was saying, come up with this vision of what this could look like. Because I think we often go into jumping into something like the MOA, which is easy in other years when there's not a pandemic, because we know what we're expecting it to look like. And we know what we need to do to provide that, what we need for our teachers and our students in that situation. And right now, as we're in a pandemic, we need to come up with what can this look like to get the best education for all of our students. We're all in agreement of that, but that's something we've never had before because we haven't been in a pandemic before. So as we jumped into an MLA with this big question mark of what is learning going to look like during a pandemic that can best reach our, all of our students in the way they need it reached, we need to think of that first and then work to our MOA and decide what we need to put into our MOA to do that. Instead of starting in an MOA setting standards um, to answer something where we don't know that answer yet. And so that's what I'm hoping the work of this group can do to brainstorm what this is going to look like, what our students need. We know data has been being taken by our teachers and staff and by you all surveying um, the community. And we know that parents are telling us what their families need. So now we need to implement plans that can meet those needs. And then we need to create the MOA that can protect our teachers and our students safety based on this solutions that we have come up with for the problems that are in front of us. So that's what I'm hoping to do with this group. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be perfectly honest and, and upfront that I'm trying to, to speak through, I, I wear a bunch of hats, you know, Dr. Morris is always quick to point that out, that I'm biting my tongue with one hat. And I'm, and I'm going to speak and move forward with the other. But, but just to let you know that one is informing the other here. And so for all the work that we all here do that, that, that relies on like quantifiable data, right? I'm going to give you the craziest thing. What we need to step into our schools right now is faith. I don't mean blind faith. I mean informed faith, right? Like the faith that like when I send my son to school, to the Crocker Farm, that his teacher is going to give him the best that, that, that he can give him, right? Like that same exact kind of faith, but we all need to have that same faith in each other, right? Because real quick, speaking from my other side, I have a staff that, that doesn't feel like people have faith in them, right? And I know that a lot of you folks, a lot of our educators feel like there are people out there that don't have faith in them. There, there are, are parents who are losing faith daily, right? And th this is the point that we need to come together. We need to Clearly, we need to, to, to take steps to get to that point, but at some point, we are going to have to leap through those doors in order to get back into these classrooms, right? Like, it's not going to be perfect, right? That, that doesn't mean that that shouldn't be our goal to try to get close to perfect, but we need to understand that we won't get there and we're going to have to take that leap of faith and actually just do it. But unfortunately, there's, there's no way to do that without us all doing that together and having that equal faith within each other. My two cents. Thank you. I don't know if you saw, I saw Kerry and then I saw Margaret uh, as the next two in that order in terms of hand raised, Doreen. Okay, thank you, Kerry. Thanks. I just want to, I think, I really appreciate what uh, Mr. Harrington just said. So I, I feel it feels hard following that, but I'd like to you know, second the idea of faith. But, you know, I, when you stated that question, I just quickly jotted down and uh, a few things. The first one, I'm not gonna lie, was we need a reduction in the spread of COVID. I mean, I think it's it's hard to have this conversation without acknowledging that yesterday was the worst day ever in this country for the pandemic. So I, I wanna put that out there. I don't think any of us are blind to that. The second word I put down was trust. And and I'm not the first person to say that, but I wanted to, I didn't wanna, you know, not, not state that. The other thing, you know, I there are a lot of things that I think it's worth acknowledging that are beyond our control that are influencing our ability to do these. And one of those is, is funding, not just from locally, but you know, from the state, from the federal government. The other is what our governor and what our um, other leaders are choosing to keep open instead of you know, closing, like choices about, you know, do you keep gyms and in-person dining open? Um, and, and I think a lot of us would agree that it, it's really frustrating to be making these choices on this micro level when we're in an environment that I feel like is not prioritizing in-person learning. So um, as much as I, I believe fully in that um, also what Ms. McDonald and others have said that there's a whole spectrum of needs in our community. And I think the, the thing that um, 
there's not going to be there's going to have to be some sort of tiered approach we're not going to just open the doors and everybody's going to come in but i think what i really would like to see is some flexibility is the other word that kind of came through some flexibility and thinking about how we can try to meet the needs of those most vulnerable students who are least able to access um, remote learning and it's going to disappoint some folks who would like to be in person but i think we have to acknowledge that there are things that are beyond the control of this committee and beyond the control of the APA and our and all of our staff that are influencing the environment we're in and making it really harder than it than it would have to be. Thank you, Ms. Dancer. Um, yes. Um, so I really, I guess, I want to pose a question. Um, Ms. McDonald mentioned flexibility. Ms. Spitzer mentioned a spectrum of needs and. Um, I'm wondering, can we think of things rather than thinking of what we had sort of specified before as we bring back this grade, we bring back that grade. Can we think more along the lines of the, what students need what? And an example I have is that I know someone who teaches and has said that the remote learning has gone really well for the most part but there's a small number of students who just need help. You know, they can't do what they need to do without some help. So if you're thinking, you know, is there a way to help that group of students in a different way with the same work that you might help the rest of the students in a class you know, can we build in that flexibility and not be thinking so much about let's bring back first and second grade, let's bring back sixth or seventh, tenth grade? I, it's a question. Thank you. Floor is still open for APEA or school committee. Ms. McGee. Um, thank you for that. And I think that uh, through this process, that we will gather the answers to a lot of our questions that will um, that will inform us of how to best serve students. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. So going back to summarizing what I've heard in this almost hour that we've been communicating together, um, we talked about basically that you are making decisions based on information shared or communication and input from stakeholders, community stakeholders, the students, the families, uh, community members, educators, uh, and you're doing this, you understand that it's hard, but that you know that it's, it's um, something that we have to prioritize. As mentioned also, it is also a uh, part of the mission statement for the district that we prioritize the work with um, students. Also, some of the assumptions that you want people to move away from or would like to spell is that the school committee does not care and that teachers do not want to be in buildings because that is basically what I'm hearing is that that is untrue. And finally, what I'm hearing too is that this being the start of a conversation to build trust between both of you, the school committee and the union, is that you would like us to be creative and flexible. And I like the way Ms. McDonald mentioned it, uh, to accommodate the needs of all students, and that um, we're looking to have informed faith and trust in each other and in the process so that we can move forward. So once again, this meeting was not supposed to bring closure. We were not supposed to leave this meeting with all the answers and a written plan as to what we're going to do. But what I'd like to leave this meeting with is next steps. So I know that both of you will provide another opportunity to meet again. And in that conversation, uh, the 
exec board has mentioned that they are going to have a meeting on Monday with their members uh, to discuss survey results. So the possibility of bringing that information back to the school committee would be important. And also uh, the establishment of regular meetings were something that everyone said would be, or that I heard would be a good start and continuation of um, building trust with everyone here. And let me see, Ms. Thibodeau mentioned that she'd like a process for receiving documents, maybe in a quicker manner so that uh, information can be processed, shared, and um, tested upon quicker, if, if that's a possibility. So I want to thank both the school committee and the APEA for having this meeting, you know, coming together, having this meeting this evening, because like I said, it's a great and important start. And with that being said, my role has ended here, and I'm going to turn the meeting back over to Ms. McDonald. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Cunningham. That was um, great. Um, and we're right on time too. Um, so uh, unless uh, there's um, any further um, conversation, would anybody like any closing comments before we adjourn the regional school committee? Yeah, I'd like to just Go ahead. My name is Elizabeth Patel. I'm a math specialist at Wildwood. I'm the treasurer for the union. And um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I had some no heads. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to appreciate Doreen because I felt like uh, I was very nervous coming into this meeting with uh, all of, with everybody. And um, I, I just really want to applaud you for a fabulous job that you did. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds like that was a, a unanimous um, agreement with that one. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so uh, I will make a motion to adjourn the regional school committee. Is there a second? Second. Um, moved by McDonald and seconded by Stancer and there's no discussion. We'll roll call. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, nay. And McDonald, aye. We are adjourned. Thank you again, everybody. Have a nice evening.